guest uh, speaker for today is a computer science PhD student at uh, UC Santa Barbara. Uh, he is a member of the Shellfish hacking team, and he's also the organizer of the IECTF um, hacking competition. Um, please give a big round of applause to Nilo Redini. Um, thanks for the introduction. Hello to everyone. My name is Nilo, and today I'm going to present you um, my work, Caronte, Identifying Multibinary Vulnerabilities in Embedded Firmware Scale. Uh, this work is a co-joint effort between me and several of my colleagues at the University of Santa Barbara and ASU. Um, this talk is going to be about IoT devices, so before we start, let's see, let's see an overview about IoT devices. IoT devices are everywhere. Um, as research suggests, they will reach the 20 billion units by the end of the next year. And a recent study conducted this year, in 2019, on 16 million households showed that more than 70% of homes in North America already have an IoT uh, network connected device. IoT devices make everyday life smarter. You can literally say to Alexa, Alexa, I'm cold, and Alexa will interact with the thermostat and increase the temperature of your room. Usually, the way we interact with uh, um, IT devices is through our smartphone. We send a request through the local network to some device, router, or door lock, or we might send the same request through a cloud endpoint, which is usually managed by the vendor of the IT device. Another way uh, is through the um, IoT hubs. The smartphone will send a request to some IoT hub, which in turn will send a request to some other IoT devices. As you can imagine, IoT devices use and collect our data, and some data is more sensitive than others. For instance, think about the data that is collected by um, a smart light bulb against data that is collected by our security camera. Um, as such, IT devices can compromise people's safety and privacy. Things, for example, about uh, the security implication of a, 40, of a faulty smart lock or the brakes of your smart car. So the question that we asked is, um, are IT devices secure? Well, like everything else, oh, this slide is a bit bad, are not. Um, OK, in 2016, the Mirai botnet compromised and leveraged millions of IT devices to disrupt core internet services such as Twitter, GitHub, and Netflix. And in 2018, 154 vulnerabilities affecting IT devices were published, which represented an increment of 15% compared to 2017 and an increase of 115% compared to 2016. So um, then we wonder, so why is, is it hard to secure IT devices? To answer this question, we have to look up how IT devices work and they are made. Usually, when you uh, remove all the plastic and uh, peripherals, IT devices look like this, a board with some chips laying on it. Uh, usually, you can find the main chip, the microcontroller, which runs the firmware, and one or more peripheral controllers, which interact with external peripherals, such as uh, the motor of your smart lock or cameras. So though the design is generic, implementations are very diverse. For instance, firmware may run on several different architectures, such as ARM, MIPS, x86, PowerPC, and so forth. And sometimes they're even proprietary, which means that if a security analyst wants to understand what's going on in the firmware, we'll have a hard time if he doesn't have uh, the vendor specifics. Also, uh, they operate in environments with limited resources, which means that they run small and optimized code. Uh, for instance, vendors might implement their own version of some known algorithm um, in, in an optimized way. Also, uh, IT devices manage external peripherals that often use custom code. Again, with peripherals, we mean like uh, cameras, sensors, and so forth. Uh, the firmware of IT devices can be either Linux-based or a blob firmware. Linux-based are by far the most common. A study showed that 86% of firmware are based on Linux. And on the other hand, blobs firmware are usually operating systems and user applications packaged in a single binary. Um, in any case, firmware samples are usually made of multiple components. 
for instance, let's say that you have your uh, smartphone and you send a request to your I IoT device. This request will be uh, received by a binary, which we term as border binary, which in this example is a web server. Uh, the request will be received, parsed, and then it might be sent to another binary called the, the handle binary, which will take the request, work on it, produce an answer, send it back to the web server, which in turn will produce a response to send to the smartphone. So to come back to the question, why is it hard to secure IT devices? Well, the answer is because IT devices are in practice very diverse. Of course, there have been various work that, uh, that have been proposed to analyze and secure firmware for, for IoT devices. Some of them using static analysis, others using dynamic analysis, and several others using a combination of both. Here I wrote several of them. At the end of the presentation, there is a bibliography with the title of these works. Um, of course, all these um, approaches have some problems, for instance. The current dynamic analysis are hard to apply to scale because of the customized environments that IT devices work on. Um, usually, when you try to uh, dynamically execute a firmware, it's going to check if the peripherals are connected and they're working properly. In a case where you don't have the peripherals, it's, it's going to be hard to actually run the firmware. Also, current static analysis approaches are based on what we call the single binary approach, which means that binaries from a firmware are taken individually and analyzed. Uh, this approach might produce many false positives. For instance, so let's say again that we have our two uh, binaries. This is actually an example that we found on one firmware. So the web server will take uh, the user request, will parse the request and produce some data. We'll set this data to an environment variable and eventually we'll execute the handle binary. Now, if you see, the parsing function contains uh, a string compare which check if some keyword is present in the request, and if so, it just returns the, the whole request. Otherwise, it will constrain the size of the request to 128 bytes and return it. The handle banner, in turn, uh, when spawned, will uh, receive the data by doing a get env on the, on the query string, but also uh, we'll do a get env on another um, environment variable, which in this case is not user controlled, and the user cannot influence the content of this variable. Then it's gonna call a function process request. This function eventually will do two string copies, uh, one uh, from the user data and the other one from the log path on two different local variables that are uh, 128 bytes long. Now in the first case, as we have seen before, the data can be greater than 120 bytes and this string copy might result in a bug, while in the second case, it will not, because here we assume that the system handles its own data in a good manner. So throughout this work, we're gonna call the first type of uh, binary, the setter binary, which means that it's the binary that takes the data and uh, set the data for another binary to be consumed. And the second type of binaries, we call them the gather binary. So um, the current bug finding tools are inadequate because other bugs are left undiscovered if the analysis only considered the, those binaries that received uh, network requests, or they're likely to produce many false positives if the analysis considered all of them individually. So then we, we wonder how these different components actually communicate they communicate through what they're called inter-process communication, which basically it's a finite set of paradigms used by binaries to communicate, such as files, uh, environment variables, MMIO, and so forth. Um, all these APCs are represented by, da by data keys, which are uh, file names, or in the case on the example before here on the right, it's the query string environment variable. Um, each binary that relies on some shared data must know the endpoint where such data will be available. For instance, again, like a file name or like even a socket endpoint on the, or the environment variable. This means that usually data keys are, are coded in the program itself, as we saw before. Therefore, to find bugs uh, in firmware in a precise manner, we need to track how user data is introduced and propagated across the different binaries. Uh, 
Okay, let's talk about our work. Before we start talking about Caronte, uh, we define our threat model. Uh, we hypothesize that attacker sends arbitrary requests over the network, both LAN and one, directly through the IT device. Though we said before that sometimes IT device can communicate through the cloud, uh, research showed that some form of local, of local communication is usually available, for instance, during the setup phase of the device. Um, Caronte is defined as a static analysis tool that tracks data flow across multiple uh, binaries to find vulnerabilities. Let's see how it works. So the first step, Caronte finds those binaries that introduce the user input into the firmware. We call these border binaries, which are the binaries that basically interface the, the device to the outside world, which in the example is our web server. Then. It tracks how data is shared with other binaries within the firmware sample, which uh, we will understand in this example that web server communicates with the handle binary, and it builds what we call the BDG. A BDG, which stands for binary dependency graph, it's basically a graph representation of the data dependencies among two different binaries, among different binaries. Um, then we detect vulnerabilities that arise from the misuse of the data using the BDG. This is an overview of, of our system. Uh, we start by taking a, a packed firmware, we unpack it. We uh, find the border binaries, then we build the, uh, the binary dependency graph, which relies on a set of CPFs, as we will see soon. CPF stands for uh, Communication Paradigm Finder. Then uh, we find the specifics of the communication, for instance, like uh, the constraints applied to the, to the data that is shared through our module multi-binary data flow analysis. Eventually, we run our insecure interaction detection module, which basically takes uh, all this information and produces alerts. Uh, our system is completely static and, real and uh, relies on our static taint engine. So let's see each one of these steps more in details. Uh, the unpacking procedure is pretty easy. We use the off-the-shelf firmware unpacking tool, BeamWalk. And then we have to find the border binaries. Now, um, we see that border binaries basically are binaries that receive data from the network, and, they, and, and uh, we hypothesize that we contain parsers to validate the data that they received. So in order to find them, we have to find parsers which accept data from the network and parse this data. Uh, to find parsers, we rely on, the, on, on related work, which basically use a uh, few metrics and uh, define through a number the likelihood for a function to contain parsing capabilities. These metrics that we use are number of basic blocks, number of memory comparison operations, and number of branches. Now, while these define parsers, we also have to find uh, if a function, if a binary takes data from the network. As such, we define two more metrics. The first one, we check if binary contains any network-related keywords as SOAP, HTTP, and so forth. And then we check if th there exists a data flow between a read from socket and a memory comparison operation. Once for each function we got all these metrics, we compute what is called the parsing score, which basically is just a sum of products. Um, once we got a parsing score for each function in a binary, we, we represent the binary with, the, with its higher, highest parsing score. Once we got that for each binary in the firmware, we cluster them using the uh, dbscan density-based algorithm and consider the cluster with the highest parsing score as containing the set of border binaries. After this, we build the, the binary dependency graph. Again, the binary, the binary dependency graph represents the data dependency among the binaries in a firmware sample. For instance, uh, this simple graph will tell us that a binary A communicates with binary C using files, and the same binary A communicates with another binary, binary B using uh, environment variables. Let's see how this works. So we start from the identified border binaries. And then we taint the data compared against network-related keywords that we found and run a static analysis, um, a static taint analysis to detect whether the binary relies on any IPC paradigm to share the data. If we find that it does, we establish if the binary is a setter or a getter, which again means that if the binary is setting the data to be consumed by another binary or if the binary actually gets the data and consumes it. 
Then uh, we retrieve the employed data key, which in the example before was the keyword uh, query string. And finally, we scan the firmware sample to find other binaries that might rely on the same data keys and schedule them for further analysis. Uh, to understand whether a binary relies on any IPC, we use what we call CPFs, which again means uh, Communication Paradigm Finder. We design uh, a CPF for each IPC, and, um, and the CPFs are also used to find the same data keys within the firmware sample. We also provide Caronte with the generic CPF to cover those cases where the IPC is unknown or those cases where the vendor implemented its, their own version of some IPC. Say, for example, that they don't use the set env, but they implemented their own set, their own set env. The idea behind this uh, generic CPF that we call the semantic CPF is that uh, data keys has to be used as index to set or, or to get some data in this simple example. So let's see how the BDG algorithm works. We start from the border binary, which again, we start from the serve request and we'll parse the URI. And we see that here, it runs a string comparison against some network rated keyword. As such, we taint the, uh, the variable P. And we see that the variable P is returned from the function to, in, to, the, from, to these two different points. As such, we continue, and now we see that data gets tainted, and data, the variable data, it's passed to the function set env. At this point, the uh, environment CPF will understand that tainted data is passed to, uh, is set to an environment variable, and will understand that this binary is indeed the set binary that, that uses the environment. Then, we retrieve the data key query string, and we'll search within the firmware sample all the other uh, binaries that rely on the same data key. And you will find that this binary will rely, uh, relies on the same data key, and we schedule this for further analysis. Um, after, after this algorithm, we build the BDG by creating edges between setters and getters for each data key. The multi-binary data flow analysis uses the BDG to find and propagate the, the data constraints from a setter to a getter. Now, uh, through this, we apply only the least street constraints, which means that uh, ideally, between uh, two program points, there might be an infinite number of paths, and ideally, in theory, a different, an infinite amount of constraints that we can propagate to the setter binary to the getter binary. But since our goal here is to find bugs, we only propagate the least uh, strict set of constraints. Let's see an example. So again, we have our two binaries, and we see that um, the variable that is passed to the, to the setM function is data, which comes from two different parts from the parse URI function. In the first case, the data that it's passed is, is unconstrained, while in the second case, the line eight is constrained to be at most 120 bytes. As such, we only propagate the constraints of the first guy. Um, in turn, the, the getter binary will retrieve this, this variable from the environment and set the variable query, oh, sorry, which in this case will be unconstrained. Uh, the insecure interaction detection run a static rent analysis and check whether tainted data can reach a sync in an unsafe way. We consider as things memcopy-like functions, which are functions that implement semantically equivalent memcopies, uh, string, string copy, memcopy, and so forth. Uh, we raise alerts if uh, we see that there is a difference of a tainted variable, and if we see there are comparisons of tainted variables in loop conditions to detect possible uh, DOS vulnerabilities. Uh, let's see an example again. So, we got here, we, have, we know that our query variable is tainted and it's unconstrained. And then we follow the taint in the function process request, which we see will eventually copy the data from Q to arg. Now we see that arg is uh, 128 bytes long while Q is unconstrained and therefore we generate an alert here. Um, our static tint engine is based on bootstrap and it's completely based on symbolic execution, which means that the taint is propagated following the program data flow. Let's see an example. So assuming that we have this code, the first instruction takes some 
the result of from, from some seed function that might return, for, for instance, um, some user inputs. And in a symbolic world, what we do is that we create a symbolic variable ty and assign to it our um, a tainted variable that we call taint ty, which is the taint tag ID. The next instruction, x, takes the value ty plus five. And in a symbolic world, uh, we just follow the data, the data flow and x gets assigned taint ty plus five, which, which effectively taints also x. If at some point x is overwritten with some constant data, the taint is automatically removed. In its original design, uh, bootstomp, the taint is removed also when uh, data is constrained. For instance, here we can see that the variable n is tainted, but then is constrained between two values, 0 and 255, and therefore the taint is removed. Um, in our uh, taint engine, we have two additions. We added a path prior prioritization strategy and we add the independencies. The path prior prioritization strategy valorizes paths that propagate the taint and deprioritize those that remove it. For instance, say again that we have our, um, that some user input comes from some function and the variable user input gets tainted. Then and gets tainted and then is passed to another function called parse. Here, if you see, uh, there are possibly an infinite number of symbolic paths in this, in this while, but only one will return uh, tainted data, while the others won't. So um, the path prior prioritization strategy uh, valorizes this path instead of the others. This has been implemented by finding basic blocks within a function that return non-constant non data. And if one is found, we follow its return before considering the others. Tain dependencies allow smart untained strategies. Let's see again the example. So we know that user input here is uh, tainted, is then parsed, and then uh, we see that um, its length is checked and stored in a variable n. This, its size is checked, and if it's higher than 512 bytes, the function return, otherwise it copies the data. Now, in this case, uh, it might happen that uh, if this string land function is not analyzed because of some static analysis imprecisions, um, the tain tag of command may be different from the tain tag of n. And in this case, though n gets untainted, command is not untainted, and this string copy can raise, sorry, can raise a false positive. So um, to fix this problem, Basically, we create a dependency between the taint tag of n and the taint tag of CMD. And when n gets untainted, command gets untainted as well, so we don't have uh, more false positives. This procedure is, is aromatic, and we find functions that implement string length semantically equivalent code and create taint tag dependencies. Okay, let's see our evaluation. Uh, we run three, three different evaluations of two different data sets. The first one, composed by 53 latest firmware samples from seven vendors, and the second one on 899 firmware gathered from the related work. In the first case, we can see that um, the total number of binaries considered are 8.5K, a few more than that. And our system generated 87 alerts, of which 51 were found to be true positive, and 34 of them were multi-binary vulnerabilities, which means that the, vulnerabilities was, the, the vulnerability was found by tracking the, the data flow from the setter to the getter binary. We also ran a comparative evaluation, which basically we tried to measure the effort that an analyst would go through in uh, uh, analyzing firmware using different strategies. In the first one, we consider each and every binary in the firmware sample independently and uh, run the analysis uh, for up to seven days for each firmware. Um, the system generated almost 21,000 alerts, considering uh, only almost 2.5K binaries. In the second case, uh, we found the, the border binaries, the parsers, and we statically analyzed only them and the system generated uh, 9.3K uh, alerts. Notice that in this case, since 
we don't know how the user input is introduced like in this, in this experiment. We consider every IPC that we find in the binary as a possible source of user inputs. And this is true for all of them. In this case, we run the BDG, and, uh, but we consider each binary independently, which means that we don't propagate constraints, and we run uh, a static single binary analysis on each one of them, and the system generated almost 13,000 alerts. Finally, we run Caronte, and the generated alerts were only uh, 74. We also run a large-scale analysis on 899 uh, firmware samples, and we found that almost the 40% of them were multi-binary, which means that the network functionalities were uh, ca carried on by more than one binary. And the system generated uh, 1,000 alerts. Now, there is a lot going on in this, in this table, like details are on the paper here in this presentation, I just go through some a summary of it. So we found that on average, a firmware contains four border binaries, a BDG contains five binaries, and some BDG have more than 10 binaries. Also, we plot some statistics, and we found that 80% of the firmware were analyzed within a day, as you can see from the top left figure. Uh, however, uh, experiments presented a great variance which we found was due to implementation details. For, for instance, we found that Anger would take more than seven hours to build some CFGs. And sometimes they were due to a high number of data keys. Um, also, we found that the number of paths, as you can see from the second picture from the top, um, the number of paths do not have an impact on the total time. And as you can see from the bottom two pictures, performance not, uh, not heavily affected affect by firmware size. And firmware size here we mean the number of binaries in a firmware sample and the total number of basic blocks. So let's see how to run Caronte. The procedure is pretty straightforward. So first you get a firmware sample, you create a configuration file containing the information of the firmware sample and then you run it. So let's see how so this is an example of a configuration file. It contains few informations, few information, but uh, most of them are optional. The only ones that are not are this one, firmware path, that is the path to your firmware. And these two, the architecture of the firmware and the base address if the firmware is a blob, is a firmware blob. All the other, all the other uh, fields are optional and you, can, and you can set them if you have some information about the firmware. A detailed explanation of all of these fields are on our GitHub repo. Once you set the configuration file, you can run Caronte. Now we provide a Docker container. You can find the link on our GitHub repo. And I, I'm gonna run it, but it's not gonna finish because it's gonna take several hours. But all you have to do is merely It's just run it on the configuration file. And it's gonna do each step that we saw. Eventually, I'm gonna stop it because it's gonna take several hours anyway. Eventually, it will produce a result file that I ran this yesterday so you can see it here. There is a lot going on here. Um, I'm just gonna go through some important like um, information. So one thing that you can see is that, oh sorry is that these are the border binaries that Caronte found. Now, uh, there might be some false positives. I'm not sure how many there are here, but as long as there are no false negatives or the number is very low, it's fine, it's good. In this case, wait. Oh, I might have removed something. Oh, no, it's here, perfect. In this case, this guy, HTTPD, is a true positive, which is the web server that we were talking before. Then, we have the BDG. In this case, we can see that we, the Caronte found that HTTPD communicates with two different binaries, file access, uh, .cgi, and cjbin. Then we have information about uh, the uh, CPFs. For instance, here we can see that, sorry, HTTPD. So uh, 
we can see here that HDPD has 28 data keys and that the semantic C CPF found 27 of them and there might be one other here somewhere that I don't see. But anyway, and then we have a list of alerts. Now, um, thanks. Now, uh, some alerts might, might be duplicates because of loops. So you can go ahead and inspect all of them manually, but I wrote an utility that you can use, which is basic, basically is gonna filter out all the loops for you. And I have to remember how I called it. This guy, yeah. And here you can see that in total generated, the, the system generated uh, six, seven, eight alerts. So let's see one of them. Oh, and I recently realized that the path that I'm reporting on the, on the log, it's, it's not the path from the setter binary to the getter binary to the, to the sync, but it's only related to the getter binary up to the sync. Um, I'm gonna fix this in the next days and report the whole path. Anyway, so here we can see that the key content type contains user input and we have, and it's passed in an unsafe way to the sync address at this address. Now, and the binary in question is called file access CGI. So we can see what happens there. If you see here, we have a string copy that copies the content of haystack to destination. Haystack comes basically from this get env. And if you see, destination comes as parameter from this function and uh, v10 and this, and this buffer it's as big as 0x68 bytes. And this turned out to be actually a true positive. Okay. So in summary, we presented a strategy to track data flow across different binaries. We evaluated our system on 952 firmware samples and some takeaways. Um, analyzing firmware is not easy and vulnerability persists. Firmware, are, uh, we, we found out that firmware are made of interconnected components and static analysis can still be used to efficiently find vulnerabilities at scale. And finally, that c communication is key for precision. This is a list of bibliography that I used throughout the presentation, and I'm going to take questions. So uh, thank you, Nilo, for a very interesting talk. If you have questions, we have uh, three microphones, one, two, and three. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead to the microphone. Um, and we'll take your question. Yes, microphone number two. Uh, do you rely on imports from libc or something like that? Or do you have some issues with like statically linked uh, binaries, thrilled binaries? Or is it all semantic analysis of a function? So, okay, um, we use Angular. So for example, if you have an indirect uh, call, we use Angular to figure out what's the target. And to answer your question, like if you use libc, some, CPF, the, the, some CPFs do. For instance, uh, the environment CPF do, and it checks if the setemp or getemp functions are called. But also we use the semantic CPF, which basically in cases where information are missing, like there is no such thing as libc, or some vendors re-implemented their own functions. We use this CPF to actually try to understand the semantic of the function, understand if it's, for example, a custom setemp. Yeah, thanks. Microphone number three. Um, in embedded environments, you often have also that the getter might work on a DMA, some kind of vendor driver on a DMA. Um, are you considering this? And second part of the question, how would you then distinguish this from your generic IPC? Because I can imagine that they look very similar in the actual code. So if I understand correctly your question, you mentioned a case of MMIO where like we where some data is retrieved directly from some address in memory. So what we found is that these addresses are usually hard-coded somewhere. So the vendor knows that, for example, from this address A to this address B, 
if some data from this peripheral. So wh when we found, when we find that some are coded address, like we think that this is like some read from some interesting data. Okay. And this would be also distinguishable from your, um, so the, the CPF, the generic CPF would yes. be distinguishable yeah, yeah. from a DMA driver by using this uh, fixed addresses you mean? Yeah, like that's, used, that's what the semantic CPF does, among the other things. Okay, thank you. Sure. Another question for microphone number three. Um, what's the license for Caronte? I, I checked the, the, the software license. I checked the Git repository and there is no license text oh, at all. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't thought about it yet. I will. Um, any more questions from here or from the internet? Okay, then a big round of applause to Nilo again. Very tough.